Okay, thank you. My name is Pete Sauer. I'm at the University of Illinois in beautiful Urbana, Illinois, and it's a nice day, and we're pleased to be bringing you a live seminar, webinar, and our speaker today is Jonathan Munkin, and his current title is Director of System Resiliency Strategic Coordination for PJM Interconnection. And in that capacity, he covers the areas of business continuity, physical and cybersecurity, risk management, and resilience planning for the world's largest wholesale energy market. That's a huge deal. And I want to mention that he comes to us with roots in Illinois, and he actually makes me a little nervous sometimes because he was the acting director of the state police. And I always wonder if uh, they're behind me when I'm driving. Uh, uh, but he's, he, has, he has served in the Army. He's a West Point grad. He was in Kosovo, if you remember where Kosovo is, in the, the Bosnia area. And he's had two tours in Iraq, and he has been decorated with the Bronze Star, which is uh, quite something. Do a Google on that if you want. It's a, a pleasure for me to introduce him, welcome him back to uh, the Midwest. He's currently in Washington, D.C. in his job with PJM, which is primarily in Philadelphia. but. His DC exposure and experience will be great for PJM. So, Jonathan, come on up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for everybody attending in person and for all 100,000 people that are joining us on the, uh, the webinar right now. I really appreciate all of you taking some of your time on a Friday afternoon to talk about something that I think is a very important issue. And hopefully, when this is all said and done, you will also think this is a very important issue. So. You saw, you had an opportunity, I'm sure, to see the abstract and get a sense for what kind of the broad strokes of what I'm going to talk about today are. But in essence, as was mentioned as part of my job title, is to try and look at that intersection of physical security, cybersecurity, business continuity, and all those things that are hugely relevant to PJM. And the good news is it's relevant to a lot more people than just PJM. So it's good that we take it seriously because there's 61 million people just in our service territory alone that are relying on us to make sure that we're doing this stuff the right way. But before I dive into it, I do want to thank uh, the University of Illinois uh, for their graciousness in hosting us and uh, for actually putting this whole event together. Amy, I just wanted to personally recognize you for the work that you did in putting everything together. So the meetings have been great, the people have been terrific, and uh, this, is a, this is an awesome opportunity, so I'm happy to have it. So let's go ahead and dive in and talk about this a little bit. Let me make sure we're getting it. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about black sky resilience, specifically from a cyber perspective. But the first thing I want to do is kind of paint the context. When I use the term black sky, what does that mean? And I think that has significant relevance in trying to understand the nature of the threat and hazard that we're trying to work with. So first and foremost, let's talk about what uh, PJM is all about. So PJM Interconnection is a regional transmission operator. As I mentioned uh, and was mentioned in the bio, we're the largest wholesale energy market in the world. We cover 13 states in the District of Columbia. We have about 975 member companies that are part of our whole network of folks and we cover about 61 million people. So the dark shaded area there of the Eastern Interconnection is our footprint, and th that's really the number one reason why we have to take this as seriously as we do, is we've got a lot of folks counting on us. So what it really boils down to for us, just like any system, you're looking for the weak spots. And for us, we identify a handful of linchpins that are disproportionately critical when you're looking at the broader spectrum of what's important to PJM and how we operate our systems. So within our territory, we have roughly 5,600 substations. So that's a lot. Trying to have a person in security in every you know, state-of-the-art protective measure that you can at 5,600 substations would be enormously difficult and extremely cost ineffective. So the idea is trying to assess the relative criticality of each one of those substations. So the traditional models that we have for performing those assessments is looking at the physical operation of the grid. So where are the substations that have single line feeds? Where are the substations that don't have as many other redundant substations around them to be able to shed load if they need to and hand it off to other substations? Looking at that type of criticality assessment 
brings us down to somewhere around two and a half to five percent of those substations are more critical than others. It doesn't mean that you don't have to care about the rest of them, but it means that these are the linchpins that we're most concerned with. So the hard part is, what we're here to talk a little bit more about today is, how do we assess that from a cyber perspective? Honestly, assessing it from a physical perspective is much easier, but the interconnected nature of all of these systems is what makes it more difficult to do the analysis when you're looking at it in a virtual environment. Operation of the energy management system, kind of a big deal. If EMS is not working, then we're not doing our job of balancing load. So uh, we have a peak load somewhere in the neighborhood of 170,000 megawatts, and trying to match that up on any given day is a difficult task. If you're attempting to do that with one or any t hands tied behind your back, now you're talking about a much more complicated scenario. And that's why talking about these types of threats and hazards is hugely relevant, because if you can affect that core system, you can really affect the operation of the grid overall. Generation is rarely effective. And the reason I say that is there are certainly, on a day-to-day -day basis, circumstances that don't allow generation facilities to operate optimally or at all, depending on what their circumstances might be. But what we really haven't experienced is a large-scale hazard that has had a profound effect on our overall generation capacity. So we maintain about a 10,000 megawatt reserve on any given day, and it's very, very rare that we need to dip very far into that. We maintain more than what we need for a very specific reason, which is if we have some of those day-to-day -day circumstances that don't allow some to work, then we need to make sure we can pick up that load where it's necessary. And then certainly within the interconnection, we can work with our partner ISOs to grab additional electricity or provide it to them if the circumstances require it. But that's what's interesting. If you start affecting generation, now you're talking about a different class or a different nature of hazard. If you don't have the electricity to provide to customers, now you have a much bigger problem on your hands. So we'll talk about that as well. Requiring visibility and connectivity. I can't overstate the importance of this. So with the proliferation of industrial control systems and SCADA, increased automation of all these systems, of the long haul connectivity between them, this is something that's hugely relevant. So we obviously monitor our entire footprint, and then we go out just a little bit beyond the fringes on all of the ISOs that we border to make sure that we can support one another if another one needs electricity. And that's something that's of paramount importance to us is the communication systems that enable all of that to happen. So some of it comes from commercial communication systems and cellular communication. Some of it is through fiber. But all of it is inherently important. So we'll talk about that in greater detail. And then that single feed transmission vulnerability. You certainly don't want to be in a circumstance where from a physical infrastructure standpoint, you're limited to just one line in and one line out, especially if whatever it's serving is critical. You don't want to find yourself in that type of circumstance. So doing the analysis there is something that, that leads down that road of trying to assess what's critical relative to the other ones. So those are our linchpins. But let's talk about what is a black sky hazard. So you can call this different things. You can call it a black swan. You can call it a low probability, high consequence event is a very popular term. Black sky just seems to roll off the tongue a little bit easier. So we'll, we'll use it for the purposes of today. So what is a black sky hazard? What are we talking about? Well, the threats can originate from different areas. So as I see it, there's roughly six black sky hazards out there. And they come from these types of threats. Nation states, unattributable threat actors, insider threats, and then you're really looking at man-made or natural events that are of a requisite scale to have a significant enough impact to really classify there. So let's look at a couple of examples of those. So here's an example of an unattributable threat. Hopefully everybody's uh, at least vaguely familiar with the Metcalf incident that happened in 2013 in the PG&E service territory. So this is an example of an unattributable actor that used very, very low technology weaponry in order to disable a major substation. So this raised a lot of red flags in the industry. As I mentioned before, in our territory alone, 5,600 substations. You can't put armed guards and ballistic fencing around every single one of them. That would be cost prohibitive. But trying to understand that if you do have a finite number of linchpins and that's exploited by an adversary, that can create a significant problem. And even the damage to the individual stations itself, in this case, it was $15 million, not a small sum of money. I definitely don't have that in my back pocket right now, but it's something that's still, still absorbed, something that can be absorbed by the budgets of the company that oversees it. But it begs a question about what is the economic impact associated with the damage to multiple substations at the same time that could potentially result in a cascading outage. 
Superstorm Sandy, always a popular one to talk about because it's, uh, it's the one in most recent memory right now from a power perspective, although I know that there will be many, many lessons learned from Hurricane Matthew. Let's talk about Sandy for a minute. So this was a $63 billion disaster. Uh, that is a significant cost. <laughs> As it happens, that places it second on the US list for the most costly disasters. Number one is Hurricane Katrina with $105 billion. So in this particular instance, this is an example of terrestrial weather that had a very, very significant impact. 4.8 million people were affected. At one point, the outages extended to about 8 million people, covered a multi-state area. But really what you're looking at is a geographic footprint that includes several states, but the majority of folks were restored within a fairly acceptable amount of time. Within about 72 hours, you're looking at a restoration rate above 85%. So that's a lot of credit to the people that worked it. That's a lot of credit to the 60,000 mutual assistance resources that were brought in from other companies around the country. But ultimately, it was a recoverable event, which is the important thing to know. And that's where we'll get into the differentiation between the events like this and Black Sky. So geomagnetic disturbances, or GMD, the most recent example we have in North America was in 1989 in Quebec. Uh, so this was about a billion dollars in economic impact. The loss of power was to about six and a half million people in Canada. There were some effects in the United States. What we don't want to see is when we get into kind of the black sky category of effect when you're looking at a, a much more powerful storm on a much larger area. So if you're talking about a Carrington level event, which the last time it happened, fortunately the bulk electric system was not affected in 1854 when the last one happened. So we were able to survive that one. It's a joke, folks. There was no bulk electric system then. No reason this can't be fun. So, the uh, GMD is uh, one of those examples of something from the geographic footprint and the number of people potentially affected and the duration of the outage starts to get into that category of black sky. 2003. So this, I, I think the closest thing approximation we can have here is it was a, uh, a terrorist squirrel in Ohio that started this whole thing. But ultimately what we saw is operational failures that led to a cascading outage that had significant impacts. So here you're looking at an economic cost of seven to ten billion dollars. We saw about 60 million people lose power to some degree for some period of time, but the restoration was above 90 percent within 72 hours. Again, good testament to the people that were conducting the response operations and a good differentiator when we're talking about the difference between this and black sky. So in essence, hopefully what you're seeing here is a trend of we've had significant events, a lot of big experiences that contribute to all of this but nothing that has quite cleared the bar of what would be considered black sky. Another one is what we're here to talk about today is the cyber nexus. So there was a prevailing thought out there that this is something that would either be really, really difficult to execute or could possibly not happen by having this type of an impact that we saw in Ukraine, which is ultimately seeing a cyber attack result in the loss of power to over 200,000 people for a period of about six and a half hours. And this, I think, was a big eye-opener for a lot of people within the community to understand that there is a cyber vulnerability there. It does need to be worked. Uh, it's not an easy solution. And this is technically listed as unattributable. I'll let you go ahead and take your guess on where you think that one originated from. Uh, but for public disclosure, that's listed as unattributable right now. Uh, but I think it, it highlights the fact that there are people that are out there that are proactively working to understand these ICS and SCADA architectures, understand these systems, map these with much greater detail, and when they choose to leverage those effects is largely dependent on other events that are seemingly unrelated to their desire to affect damage. So that's the hard thing to understand is there's a lot of interdependencies. Now all of these things are significant, but when you get to the black sky category, you're really looking about at two things. One is the geographic footprint of the event. It needs to be big. How big? Well, it needs to test the limits of what we're capable of doing at an interconnection level. Right now, the way the US power grid is set up, we're on three main interconnections, and there's not a whole lot of power flow between them. In essence, the assumption is that whatever the event is will not extend beyond one of those interconnections, that they'll be able to support, as we have in the past, between ISOs within one interconnection. So think big, large geographic area that really tests the limits of what we're capable of doing from a load balancing perspective and a grid operation perspective. The second thing is duration, and this is another unique component to Black Sky. I gave you kind of the time frames of some of these other events for a very specific reason. So if I told you 
you are not going to have electricity at your house for 72 hours. Generally speaking, what's the reaction to that? Eh, okay. Not a huge deal. Burn candles, kind of fun. You know, as long as I know it's 72 hours and three days later everything's good, it sounds like a fun little vacation. Not a big deal. If I told you we don't know how long this thing is going to last, but it could be weeks or months, how are you feeling right now? I mean, people get anxious if their iPhone falls below 40%, right? Okay, what if I told you that you're not going to be able to plug it in in your house for a month because the power is going to be out? Well, in essence, that's really that type of threshold that you need to be very mindful of, not just because of the human impact of extended duration outages, but the fact that the system, our system, is not particularly designed to deal with long-term outages. Why did I pick 72 hours? Is that an arbitrary number? Any doomsday preppers in the audience? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Your food goes bad in 72 hours. 72 hours is the standard, whether it's Red Cross or emergency management for individual preparedness. Have enough food, water, and medicine to sustain yourself in your home for 72 hours because at 72 hours, what happens? The cavalry arrives. Whatever that means, the cavalry is there, right? I'm here from the government. I am here to help. So 72 hours is kind of that cutoff. Well, what if it was longer than 72 hours? So now you have the social impact of that, the societal impact of that. But then in an operational perspective, a lot of the systems follow that same logic. So whether you're talking about pipeline systems, cellular communication networks, water wastewater treatment facilities, all of these things really use 72 hours as a planning factor. And if the electricity industry can't hit that target of 72 hours, you're going to get into an environment of cascading impacts that's well beyond the scope of things that we've had to deal with before. And that comes into the vital interdependencies. You cannot assess an individual system on its own from any perspective, and cyber least of all. There are shared vulnerabilities between each of these sectors. There are shared uh, resources and points of virtual connectivity between the systems that are absolutely important to the operation of each one individually. But let's talk about two in particular that concern the power industry. So I'd like to say, so I'm going to say, for, bear with me, that electricity is the center of the universe and everybody really, really needs electricity. Well, this is where we start getting into the chicken or the egg conversation of which one comes first and who needs who more. So let's talk about two that's a really, really big deal. Let's start talking about natural gas. So natural gas. Everybody got a sense for this little trend line right here? So coal down, natural gas up. That's the key trend that you need to keep an eye on. Right now in PJM's territory alone, more than 90% of all the generation projects that are in our queue over the next couple of years are natural gas. 40% of our Black Star capacity has swapped out from coal to natural gas just in the last three years. All of these things are hugely relevant to the conversation about how this works. So there's a couple of issues. First and foremost, a natural gas. Just-in-time delivery is the key. Your fuel source shows up at 32 miles an hour, and if it stops, you don't have any left on site. That's a big problem. There are not massive storage tanks at every natural gas generation station that they can rely on for extended periods of time. If the pipeline systems stop, they lose their fuel. There are certainly some exceptions to that rule. There are dual fuel plants. There are other sources of electricity that you can rely on, but because so much of our energy is coming now from natural gas as a fuel source, you cannot ignore the importance of it. A couple of other things. Disproportionate number of natural gas black start plants. Everybody familiar with the concept for black start? Those are your islands that you're trying to build back out from if you have a mass outage. Well, if you're heavily dependent on those for your black start facilities, you certainly have a new challenge on your hands if you lose that, if you actually lose access to that natural gas. And there's a shockingly low number of natural gas plants that have firm service contracts with natural gas providers. Interestingly enough, does anybody want to guess who's number one on the list for natural gas companies to provide services to? Anybody? Homes. Number one, population density is right at the top. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is they, kind of, they have a moral obligation to provide what people use for heat, especially if it's you know, a chilly day in Urbana. But you also have a circumstance where if you actually lose the pilot light in a house, you have to literally go around to every single one that lost gas pressure and relight them all when you restart. 
So in a city like Chicago, if you have to go redo 3 million pilot lights after it's out because you lost natural gas to all those, that is a logistical undertaking that no gas company has ever attempted, and they don't want to either. The other issue is firm gas contracts cost money. So you're hedging bets. Why do I pay for the firm gas contract every single year if I don't really expect to need it because I'm pretty sure that the natural gas will be there? So let's talk about some of the distribution systems. The other thing is the natural gas distribution system is very different than it is from electricity. PGM is a regional transmission operator. There is no such thing as a regional transmission operator in the natural gas industry. We don't have a peer organization that we reach out to that does balancing over that large area. There's a growing number of electricity powered compression stations. So along all of these pipeline systems, you have many, many compression stations, most of which run off of the natural gas that's flowing through the pipe itself. But for a variety of different reasons, most specifically efficiency, uh, automation control, and for environmental regulations, there's a lot more electricity powered ones. You see what I'm getting at here? If you don't have electricity to the electricity compression stations, now you're starting to get into that self-licking ice cream cone scenario. Fewer system redundancies and less coordination. They're not necessarily built the same way in terms of the standards of reliability and efficiency. I think everybody saw great examples in the southeast when there were two line breakages over the last six months or so, and there was panic at the disco when you're talking about having a major fuel line out and what it did to gas prices, the availability of gasoline in that particular area of the country, and there are many, many pipeline systems that are uh, disproportionately necessary or essential to our generation operations. Some have a lot more generation capacity along that pipeline than others. So it gives you that sense of kind of comparative impact. Longer repair times, for sure. It's underground. That's actually one of the reasons why the electricity industry doesn't like to put everything in the ground. Yes, it might be more survivable when you're talking about high wind environments, but it also is much more expensive and more time consuming to repair because you have to dig it up to find out where your problem was. If it's above ground, above ground it's pretty obvious to see which pole is laying down on the ground. So pipeline systems take longer to repair to get those back online, and that's something to consider as well when we're looking at that 72-hour window. A broken pipeline is something that could be down for a significant amount of time, certainly beyond the 72 hours. And all this is to say that natural gas industry has a lot of the automation systems just like the electricity industry. They share many of the similar cyber vulnerabilities that we experience on the electricity side. But the important thing to note is you really just can't have one without the other. We absolutely require natural gas in order to power our modern bulk electric system. So let's talk about communications. Communications, because of that level of automation, and because we've moved away from a manual operation of the grid, has also, also led us down the road for another interdependency. So we've done as much as we can as an example within PGM. We focused on having redundant communication systems. We have more than one service provider to provide both our internet and voice capability to make sure that if one system is down, the other one is functioning. That being said, it's not quite that simple. Companies like AT&T and Verizon, they share physical infrastructure. They share towers, they share switching stations. So it's very possible to affect both simultaneously. But I can tell you that at the end of the day, this is essential for grid operations. In the modern world, it is absolutely essential in grid operations. Yes, you can function for a certain amount of time if you don't have all your full data linkages for EMS, but not for that long and not particularly efficiently in that environment. Yes, you can have a person standing there with a phone and saying, okay, I'm giving you the readings right now. This is where we're at. Okay, maintain your current level, go up, go down. You can only do that for so long before you run into a circumstance where the inefficiency of grid operation will ultimately have a very detrimental effect to the system overall. And we are heavily dependent on those commercial systems. Some companies have their own communication systems. Some companies try and leverage fiber as much as you can, both of which are good things if they're operated properly. But that's not a, that's not a panacea. That's not a fix all for everything either. And there's that extensive shared physical infrastructure that has to be considered. So it's a two-way street yet again for electricity. So I mentioned 72 hours before. Well, it's actually even less for the cellular industry. Really, you're looking at about 24 hours of backup power at any individual location. And more locations have battery backups, uninterruptible power supplies, than have backup generators. Even if they had the generators, what's the problem with generators? Fuel. Fuel. You got to get fuel to them. Absolutely. 
The failure rate of generators in Hurricane Sandy was 54%. That's a really high number, but it was a combination of factors. They either ran out of fuel, they were improperly maintained, so they just broke down because you don't run them a lot, and if all of a sudden you're running them for days at a time, you can have some problems there. Or it was improper load match. It wasn't a good understanding of how much power the building or facility needed, and they matched it with the wrong generator and broke it down. There's few alternative mediums for communication. The silver bullet people like to reference is, don't worry, I will pull out my satellite phone. I can fix that problem for you. Well, if you're trying to manage 5,600 substations on satellite phones, you are going to have a significant challenge in executing in that environment. It certainly works in certain capacities, but not in every capacity. And as I mentioned before, that manual operation of the grid will need to be supported by some communication connectivity. And this is something that's uh, an effort underway, even from a cyber perspective. If you're in the midst of a cyber event as a power company, you have to try and figure out what data sources you can potentially trust and where are your secure networks that are still in place so you can maintain grid operation. And what does that look like? What does that backup secure network look like? Well, right now, it doesn't look like anything because it's not really there. We have redundant systems that I'll tell you about in a few minutes, but when you're talking about a national secure network to be able to maintain a certain level of grid functionality in a cyber environment, that's something that needs further development. So efficiency and reliability have been the longstanding metrics that the electricity industry has been measured by. But the hard part is taking that and moving into the area of resilience because it's not the same thing. There's a definitional difference between reliability and resilience. Most importantly, from a resilience perspective, you're actually assuming that the event will happen. By definition, resilience is your ability to bounce back from a significant event in an acceptable amount of time. So what does that mean? So let's talk about a few things. What if we did have that widespread long duration outage? Where if we in that black sky category, that will truly test our resilience as an industry. The other thing to consider here is natural versus malicious. So if you have an earthquake, if you have a hurricane, if you have a solar storm, those types of things are indiscriminate in terms of what infrastructure they hit. They hit where they hit. It's just going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, it's just going to be what it is. On the malicious side, the worst part about it, like cyber, is it's going to presumably hit you where it hurts the absolute most. So if you have a relatively unimportant node, if you have a relatively unimportant substation, it's much less likely to be the target. You're really going to get hit where it hurts the most. That doesn't really feel good, knowing that that's really where you're most vulnerable is where you're going to get hit. Then you get into things like the challenges of scale. Situational awareness in a cyber environment is a really, really difficult thing to wrap your mind around. It's difficult in any type of incident environment, but in a cyber environment, a lot of the tools that we rely on to maintain situational awareness, it's very likely that they're not going to be available to us. If there are issues with data corruption, if there are any interruptions in the communication system, the things that we rely on to understand the breadth and extent of impact and to execute the plans and processes that we have in place for restoration and recovery, we might not have access to any of that. Prioritization. I have three kids, and I love all of them equally. You will have to pick favorites in this environment. Okay, Not a nice thing to say, but in this environment, you have to be concerned about how you prioritize your restoration activities. And the hard part is, in the scenarios that I mentioned earlier, we were able to rely on tried and true restoration methodology, largely speaking. The bigger the event, the more severe the event, the harder that gets to do because the fundamental nature of what you're trying to accomplish is changing. In a normal environment, maximum number of customers in the minimum amount of time. It's pretty simple math. How many people can I get back up with electricity as fast as possible? In a black sky environment, you're actually talking about the survivability of the grid. Can we make this a recoverable event versus an irrecoverable event? Now, the answer is obvious. You want to go with the first one. You want it to be recoverable. But the processes that you utilize in that environment are inevitably going to be different. Uh, the national priorities for restoring sure. uh, life. Because, sure. for instance, you, know, you may say, I'm not going to restore power to neighborhoods because I need to restore hos to hospitals and to critical infrastructure. And that's a different question than what you've just said about restoring power to the grid. Absolutely. That's a very, very different question. So the survivability of the grid in this environment is to say, 
don't actually, make sure you can see the forest through the trees. So if you're trying to focus on tactical level restoration activities and your black start processes are not executing successfully, you're not gonna restart the grid anyway. And then when you actually get into the critical infrastructure assessment, the example that you gave is a good one and I always like to turn this one on its head. So if you ask the hospital, you can have one of two things. You can either have electricity or you can have clean water. Which one do you want? Clean water. You can operate a hospital without electricity. You cannot without clean water. It is no longer a sanitary environment and they have to evacuate. So in that environment, and take it from a societal impact standpoint, water and wastewater services. If you must evacuate an area if you do not have wastewater services from a sanitation and public health environment, and you cannot truck enough water into Manhattan to give bottled water to seven million people. So to your point, those types of priorities are absolutely essential, and it's different than the narrative of how we've conducted restoration activities in previous events. And I would suggest that the two are inseparable, because yeah. if you have a, as you referred to, a black sky event, this is way beyond the power grid. Yes. Well beyond, absolutely. And that's where those interdependencies come into play in a big way. Uh, the other thing that I had listed on here was critical low density engineering assets. So the example here is understanding that we have robust mutual assistance systems for relatively routine assets, line trucks, bucket trucks, vegetation teams, cherry pickers, lines, pole, the stuff that we need all the time. What if you're in an environment where you're talking about specialized engineering assets that are not part of the existing mutual, mutual assistance process? So right now, the industry is in the process of developing cyber mutual assistance because we didn't have it before. We didn't have a way to mutually support one another like we would if somebody said, send me 10 line crews. Sure, no problem, I got it. Okay, send me your enterprise information security personnel. Uh, oops, I can't really do that. So trying to understand the enabling mechanisms to execute and then also understanding what are the skill sets and capabilities that need to be part of that category in this unique environment. Relay technicians. Nobody keeps a bunch of those folks just sitting around waiting for a rainy day. They're expensive. They take time to grow them. So you're not going to have a bunch of extras laying around and trying to develop the mechanisms to share those is important. But it all comes down to, and we'll, we'll kind of drive this down to the cyber side of things, of looking at what your priority activities are. At the core of it is defense of your system. No matter what, you're trying to stop the bad thing from happening. If you can, you should. So protecting your system is of paramount importance. But there are a lot of different things that come into play when you're talking about defense and certainly when you're talking about response and recovery in that environment. So trying to get everything from information sharing. The single most powerful tool when you're talking about cyber defense is information sharing. If it's happening to you, there's a really, really good chance that it's happening to someone else. Maybe you've seen the line, it's possible that your life is only serving the purpose of being a warning for others. In this environment, you need to make sure that if you're being hit, that information is being widely shared, especially in the power industry, because we have shared vulnerabilities. We have similar architectures. There's only a handful of major software programs that are out there that are utilized operator systems. So sharing that is important, and cross-sector information sharing is important as well. So whether you're talking about the natural gas industry or the communications industry, same sort of thing. That intelligence needs to be shared. Vulnerability management. You can't defend against everything absolutely all of the time. So trying to figure out what your key vulnerabilities are, what those routes of ingress and egress are from a cyber intrusion perspective, very, very important. Impact analysis. You have to make sure that you know the difference between a system you absolutely cannot live without and a system that would be a significant inconvenience not to have. And if you're spending equal resources protecting both of those things, you need to reprioritize how you're really doing it. Making sure that the, most of your resources are being dedicated on the thing that has the greatest amount of impact on your organization based on your analysis. And trying to do things like data management and predictive analytics. Data management's really about reducing your attack surface area, making sure that if there's critical data that you possess, one, do you still need to have it or not? If you don't, then don't carry it anymore. If you do, then you need to figure out how you're actually going to manage that data and protect it. Predictive analytics is a great way to try and understand what are the precursor signs of a pending event. The more you can see that, the better. In Ukraine, six to nine months they were inside the system. 
The average turnaround time for a company in the United States to recognize and detect an intrusion in their system is 245 days. Oops, that's a long time. So the more you can do predictive analytics to look for anomaly detection, understanding things that don't look like an average Tuesday, that's very, very important to knowing that your first step is solving a problem, right? Knowing you have a problem. <laughs> so then it comes down to response coordination. What does the dance card look like in a black sky environment for response? Really, really, really complicated. Really complicated. So how many people would guess that a championship football team has never practiced the plays that they're gonna run in the game? I certainly hope not. They're probably not a championship team. So being able to coordinate the response, understanding the roles and res responsibilities, communicating what those priorities are in advance is hugely relevant to it. And I come back to, in the response environment, things like situational awareness. If you don't know what people to your left and people to your right are doing right now, from an industry perspective, you're only solving one part of the problem, and it might be that you're actually hurting the system more than you're helping the system if you're not understanding what's happening elsewhere. Response coordination with commercial and government sources. I'll talk about that in cyber mutual assistance perspective, but I hear it all the time when, I, having been a, a government person myself doing disaster response, there are an amazing number of assumptions that are made about what the government can or can't do or should or shouldn't do. And very few of those, unfortunately, are discussed in advance of said event. Usually it's happening in the midst of it, you're, you're hip deep in it, and you're trying to figure it out on the spot. Trying to understand what type of resources are out there and how that mutual support needs to play out is a big part of it. And commercial sources. This is another issue. There's a finite amount of bandwidth out there, even on the commercial side, where all of these companies, so take a lot of the electricity industry, contracts with the same handful of companies to provide support, surge support, on cyber defense and response when we need an event. What happens if we all call at the same time? Who gets it first? That's not an easy question to answer, but it's a problem that needs to be explored. So let's talk about some of uh, PGM's proactive efforts for cyber resilience. So we have uh, two complete control systems. We have two totally redundant control systems that have identical levels of operation, and we rotate back and forth on a regular basis, which one is the primary that's operating our grid to make sure that we don't have just a super shiny backup that we really hope works on game day. We continue to use it on a regular basis. And even when one's the primary, the other one is still open with a skeleton crew in the event that they need to take over the full operations of our grid. And they can do that in less than two minutes. But we have, from a cyber perspective, two very specific systems that are there for resilience beyond that physical infrastructure. One is called Golden Image, and the other one's called the Virtual Backup Control Center. And each of these systems has characteristics to mitigate some of the effects of a cyber attack. So, Golden Image. It's an air gap system, and yes, I'm, I'm, all, I'm with you. There's no such thing as an air gap th system. Okay, yep, gotcha. Okay, so in every way that we can make it air gap, it's an air gap system uh, that's there that takes a complete snapshot of our entire system on a monthly basis. In essence, what it does is it gives us a clean version of our operating system that we can fall back to in the event that we detect an intrusion or we see corruption in our system. And if the, last, if the most recent one isn't clean, you go back until you get to the last one that was clean, and then you use that as your baseline going forward. It's kind of a reset button. Um, it can run the power grid for a, a good period of time, but it doesn't run the markets, which is an important differentiator. Presumably, in a black sky environment, you have to make an important decision. Are you going to continue to operate the markets or not? Most likely, if the operational impacts are severe enough, the answer is you will not. Grid operations takes precedent over market operations. But again, how long can you go without the markets before the economic impact on all of the energy providers and users within your system is such that they can't sustain those operations? How about the VBOC, the Virtual Backup Control Center? So this is basically our, our system to do a rapid recovery if we need to. Golden Image takes a little bit longer. This is a rapid recovery system. Um, so in essence, it can perform pretty much all of the functions of one of those, those control centers, except it can do it completely virtually. So ideally, you could run our system remotely. Now, remotely is probably the wrong word to use because it makes it sound like there's some backdoor linkage that somebody could hop into our system. That's not how it's designed. Uh, that's not the way it's set up. But it does mean that without the uh, access to the full physical controls of the control center, you could still actually operate the grid. 
Uh, we use it as a backup ACE calculator, so that's something that's very, very important for us. Um, so we maintain it as a backup and it runs on a regular basis. So it's, it's a very quick transition over the system. And it is capable of running a full EMS, including our advanced applications, of which we have a couple hundred. So I said we would talk about cyber mutual assistance, so let's talk about it. So right now, presumably, there are three types of assistance available if an electricity company or any other company runs into a significant cyber event. So one is industry to industry. So power companies can support each other. We are just at the, the beginning stages of development right now of being able to put together that framework. So being able to execute today in the next 10 minutes would be difficult. It would be much easier today than it was just a year or two ago, but it would be difficult. So understanding how we develop that, what are the capability requirements, and then even, as I mentioned down at the bottom here, governance challenges. Who owns the asset? Who has the final authority on who gets what when? That's a big, big problem. Now the good news is that problem is not a unique one to this particular form of assistance. I can tell you as a former state director of emergency management, providing EMAC, which is Emergency Management Assistance Compact, resources to other states, that's a challenge that's run into on a regular basis. The governor controls that asset and another governor asks for it and says, I need that widget. And if multiple governors are asking at the same time, they have to make a decision as to which one it's gonna go to. There's no adjudication authority built into that network. There are some forms of adjudication authority built in for industry mutual assistance through the Edison Electric Institute and a national response event. But understanding how that works is difficult. Private sector to industry, as I mentioned with the contract, if everyone calls at the exact same moment and says, Northrop Grumman, send the go team, we're ready for you. Even if you're looking at government assistance, government to industry like an ICS cert, there's only four ICS cert teams. Now on any given day, they're not using all four teams. They have a bench, they have depth available. But in a large scale event, if multiple power companies are being impacted, that becomes a bandwidth problem very quickly. Jonathan, Not to mention what, the fact- what, what are those teams and what do they do? ICS CERT, uh, Industrial Control System Computer Emergency Response Teams. It's not a government thing if it doesn't have a cool acronym. So yeah, so that, that's owned by uh, the Department of Homeland Security and it's specifically designed to be able to handle response activities for industrial control systems. And they're used on a regular basis to do penetration testing. They're utilized to do all kinds of uh, assessments at the request of industry if they want to come into the company and say, poke holes in our system and, and work with us on developing better systems. But that's four teams. The other issue is, on the industry side, if companies start falling like dominoes, meaning that they're detecting intrusions and they're starting to see effects from cyber, how excited are you, if you have not yet been touched, about sending your best IT folks to help with someone else's problem right now? Nah, not so much, not so much. So that presents a unique challenge, and it also defines some of that space for both the commercial assets and the government assets. So the government exists in a very, very unique category where they can afford to hold the asset even if they don't need it every single day and make it available when it absolutely is necessary. Lane D confliction is a big problem. There's a lot of different capabilities out there. So whether you're talking on the government side, if it's investigation driven, it's owned by the FBI. It's owned by the FBI. If it's infrastructure driven, it's owned by DHS. But sometimes those things overlap. And they do work together, they do coordinate. But understanding in this type of environment, who has the right skill sets, the right specialization, the right bandwidth and capability to execute specific missions, we cannot afford in this environment to be wasteful of hugely valuable resources like this. So knowing what that is, and knowing what that dance card is in advance, very, very important. Cross training and exercise, can't overstate this one way too important. You absolutely must see what this looks like. If someone shows up on game day, like the saying goes, if you need a friend, it's too late to make one. Okay, if somebody shows up at your facility and says, don't worry, I'm here to help, and they haven't been on your system before, they don't know your system very well, you don't know them personally, just from a trust perspective, all of these present very, very unique challenges, and they need to be drilled in advance. Okay. So. So if I may, a quick sure. question on the, it's on. Oh, they, oh he's running. Uh, if you go back to the other slide, and yeah. you talk about the cross-training exercise, you know, I've, my Army experience says the devil's in the details. Oh, yeah. And the devil's in the details when you're operating a power system. And so 
do you actually use your alternate command post in an exercise mode to recover from these things? Because the only way you can really test that is in a in a real control center, and unless you can shut one down, so do you do that? Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, and in our backup control center, we also have a completely uh, a total replica system that we use just for training and exercise. So it, it simulates the entire environment of the control center, and that's what we use. And we also make that available to our member companies, so they come in and train on it. Um, that being said, you can only take it so far in an exercise environment, uh, and I think that's something that requires the continued engagement from a from a whole industry, whole of industry perspective to be able to do it. Not to mention the fact that just because we do it as a company and just because there are other companies out there that do it, there's 6,400 electricity utility companies in the United States. And I'm willing to bet that not all of them have the resources available to have an entirely redundant control center plus a, a drill and exercise simulator all the same. Uh, so understanding that how we share that res those resources and how we execute, it gets even more complicated when you get into things like water wastewater. There's 160,000 water wastewater companies out there. And the, the spectrum of preparedness levels and resources is vastly different there as well. So those who have it need to find the right opportunities to share with those that need it. So a great question. Merging opportunities. So these are some things that we could potentially do uh, in a partnership environment within industry, and uh, not just within industry, but with industry and government, of looking at ways that we can make some of these things a little bit easier. So intel sharing. What's the biggest challenge with intel sharing? Anybody want to take a guess? I can tell you from experience there are multiple issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots, lots, for sure. But one um, is uh, becoming aware of the problem. Sure. Uh, you're overwhelmed with the amount of information, so you've got to be able to sort the information, categorize, yep. make sense of the information. And then the other guy's got to be listening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we run into all kinds of problems with each one of those particular areas, uh, not to mention the fact that a lot of the threat intelligence, depending on who collects it, is classified. And the level of sharing that you can have is very, the, the equity of who needs to know it and who actually gets access to it, it's not a very good balance. So trying to find ways to package that intel in an actionable way is something that we could make significant strides on. So whether you're looking at things like attribution, if you're looking at product, if there's a, a specific system that has a unique vulnerability, a product that a lot of people have, you know, a lot of people use the same routers, a lot of people use the same hardware. If there are problems with those types of systems, if you can package the intelligence in a way that allows you to lower classification levels, and make it more focused as it comes through to make sure you know what you're actually getting when you're looking at it instead of sifting and trying to do the analysis on your own. Those kind of things could be very, very helpful, including things like tactics, tactics, techniques, and procedures. So knowing what those adversaries are doing and how they're executing is the first step to detection, for sure. Joint intelligence generation. So we certainly try and be in receiving mode as much as possible, but there's a significant capacity within industry in partnership with government and academia to generate intelligence. So how can we create circumstances, whether it's through things like honeypots or sinkholes, how can we actually work collectively together to create opportunities for us to gain a better understanding of all of these things? Who are the threat actors? What are the techniques that you're utilizing? Really create opportunities where we merge the people with the statutory authority and those with the operational capability into one spot to be able to generate that intelligence in a more meaningful way. Bring the practitioners and the policy folks together in one room. R&D support for tools and capabilities. There are a lot of great things that are happening in a lot of institutions around the country. Whether it's national labs, whether it's within academia, whether it's in groups like DARPA, there's a lot of uh, EPRI, ESCC, there's a lot of folks that are doing research and development in areas that are relevant for cyber. The idea is to try and make sure that we know what everybody else is doing, not just for the sake of awareness, but for recognizing the fact that working as a collective, we will be much more effective as work than working independently. Intrasector information sharing. Some sectors are just better at this than others, and some people tend to see these trends earlier. You can make a strong case that the best intel sharing industry in the United States is the financial sector. They immediately recognize 
that they all have a lot at stake and they are heavily leveraged against one another. They are wholly invested in the success of the other banks. So they need to make sure that this works. And as such, they share very, very well. There's a lot that they could teach us. And, there's, and I can tell you, if you ask them whether or not electricity was important to them, the answer would be yes. We really need electricity to do literally everything that we do. So identifying what these things are and trying to figure out the best ways to be able to share this intel, I think, is very important. Last one is even the possibility for DOD partnerships. Department of Defense has enormous capability. It's something that we're looking into to try and figure out how we can work more with them. Department of Defense, from a mission assurance perspective, completely relies on private infrastructure in order to function. Electricity, natural gas, water wastewater, communications. They are completely dependent on continued access to private sector infrastructure in order to maintain their mission capability. They have a vested interest in making sure that we succeed, and vice versa. We have an invested interest in making sure that they have a very specific role to play in the event that there's a state actor that's attacking our infrastructure. Well, there's really only one department of the federal government that's authorized to have the authority to conduct foreign operations. It happens to be the Department of Defense. So all of these things, I think, are huge opportunities that if we work in the collective, we can identify what the priority actions are. But right now, in forums like this, in institutions like the University of Illinois, it's a great opportunity for us to do it. So I look forward to continuing the dialogue. And let's do that right now and take some questions. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. In Cred C, we are very conscious of the balance between energy delivery people and cyber people. So I want to ask Gabe Weaver to come up here. He knows about all the cyber issues and will be able to differentiate the questions better than me. <laughs> so I bring you uh, Gabe, who actually got all his degrees in Dartmouth, I think. Yeah, that's right. But he's mm -hmm. now here at Illinois. No, I really enjoyed your talk. I have a few questions myself. So are there That's any good. questions in the audience? Yeah, Carl. So now PJM, we spoke last night, you have 800 companies that are part of PJM. And so the question is, you've talked about PJM as the orchestrator of the conductor, but you also talked about islanding. So you know, at the very basic level, each individual entity should be able to operate independently, providing power to their service. Could, so could you just kind of describe how that islanding uh, to provide basic services works in the PGM framework? Yeah, so among those, uh, those member companies, some folks do pure generation, some folks do pure distribution, some folks do pure transmission. But in essence, the way PGM's broken up is into 20 TO zones, transmission operator zones. Each one of those needs to be capable of operating independently. In the event that PJM cannot perform our balancing activities, we push it down to the, T the 20 TO zones and say, run. Run until we're back up. And once we're back up, then we'll start doing the cross zone coordination. Um, each one of those TO zones has their own black start requirement to make sure that they have enough generation to meet the necessary critical black start loads within their respective TO zones. But that's about as far down the chain as it goes. So not all companies are vertically integrated enough to be able to operate independently, but they do have their operating requirements within their respective TO zones. Uh, presume in each of those uh, TOs, they also have the opportunity to subdivide also. They can. Authority down Some of them can, for sure. And so are your governance uh, boundaries, do they coincide with your TO districts? So governance boundaries, we don't necessarily have governance authority. So we can't tell operators how they're going to fix a problem, per se. Well, in this case, I'm thinking more of the, uh, the civil authorities, the governor. Sure, OK. The county, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because they're the decision makers, ultimately. Because Absolutely. they're the commander. They don't, uh, technically, they don't align. So between the 13 states and the District of Columbia, the four different FEMA regions that we touch on, those 20 TO zones do not align with geopolitical boundaries. Those are actually based on grid operation capabilities. So that adds to the layers of complexity there in terms of uh, TO zones that might bridge or straddle state lines, might fall within the jurisdictional boundaries of a city or not. All of those things present very unique issues, for sure. Any more questions? 
Uh, Jonathan, I have a question. Yeah. So um, in your joint intelligence generation, you mentioned honeypots and sinkholes. Are you guys actively deploying something today, or is that an area that you're exploring, let's say, research in to try to understand what you could deploy? And if so, at what type of level are you interested in going? Um, high interaction, as an example, versus just, oh, this is sort of listening on ports, but not really mimicking anything further. Yeah, so we don't have anything yet. This is really just kind of a put it out there as an opportunity, something that could be developed, uh, recognizing that the undertaking, to your point of the level of involvement that happens and the level of, uh, and the depth of what you're trying to accomplish, doesn't necessarily fit within um, the resource or economic capabilities of a company. So it would really require to, to be able to maintain that operation, to be able to do the analysis of what you're getting. It would really require a joint effort from between public and private sector to recognize that there, there has to be a shared effort to do it. So it's not something that we're doing currently. It's something that we could certainly consider. And I think something that we're generally interested in, a, in that longer term strategy of what we can do to improve the intelligence that we have access to. Yeah, I'm gonna take, a, take one question from the web and then come back. So uh, are there any examples of exercises to join to examine black sky issues? Yeah, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so we conduct a lot of exercises internally and drills internally as a company, but in terms of the black sky scale, uh, there's two coming up in 2017, uh, one called EarthX in August of 17, and then in November of 17 will be GridX4, which is administered by NERC. So that'll be their fourth iteration of that particular exercise, and each one of them takes into account a basically an interconnection or a national level event to try and test our, our resilience in that environment. So um, EarthX this year will be focused on situational awareness, communications, and decision making. And then GridX4 is a combined cyber physical attack that addresses a lot of different uh, areas, but also includes that situational awareness component. Okay, thanks. Uh, there was a question in the back earlier. Oh, yeah, um, quick question. In the beginning of the talk, you talked about um, the percentage of your nodes that were deemed as critical, mm -hmm. but it was a range of values. So I was wondering if you could expand upon how you define a critical node and it, how often is it evaluated that a node is indeed critical, so the periodicity yeah. of it. Absolutely. So normally we use the criticality assessments are a result of our analysis on efficiency and reliability. So in terms of how well a particular population is being serviced, what are their reliability standards and ratings, what are their efficiency ratings, and if we see lag in any of those particular areas, then we make an additional infrastructure investment, whether it's adding a redundant transmission line, whether it's uh, expanding on a substation or whatever that case may be, or adding generation capacity based on the, the pending requests that we have to join. So it's usually utilizing those factors. The particular reason that I use the range is we do have an exact number. It's just not something that we typically talk about in a public forum. <laughs> okay. Uh, second question from the web. Yeah. Uh, sharing intel with the right people is essential, but the more you share, well, wouldn't that increase alerting the threat actor? Sure, absolutely. So I think this is the constant push and pull of threat sharing, of understanding that if I share it too widely, there will be a circumstance where the bad guys will know that this is what we're talking about, and then, and then you run into a problem. I think there's, uh, you cannot just toss that concern aside. What I can tell you is, um, increased information sharing, the benefits of increased information sharing, in my opinion, this is just John's opinion, outweigh the risks associated with the potential threat actor possibly seeing what you're trying to do. Uh, because if it's enough that it's stopping you from sharing critical information, the vulnerabilities that you're creating are much, much worse. If, if you don't have access to information that would allow you to posture your system or perform system checks or do patches or upgrades to your system, such that it would protect you from something that should never have really affected your system. That's the bulk of the threats that are out there. And now you're playing a probability game. And you're understanding that there could be a lot of low scale threats that should never have affected your system, but because of an inability to share, you found yourself in a circumstance where you are being adversely affected by them. So with the right people is definitely essential. Um, whether that means every single person that's involved in it has a top secret level clearance, that's where I think we get too, the pendulum swings too far in one direction. When, when, Pete, you had a question, though. Oh, uh, yes, the young man in the front. Well, I was going to say, half of this audience is probably a student body looking for a job. 
Is PJM hiring? Should they apply to you? Oh, absolutely. Not? Yeah, just hand me an application before I leave. We'll get everything squared away for you. No problem. We'll get you started next week. Uh, I can tell you this, this, is a, this is an area where PJM is investing more in. So my position didn't exist uh, before I started in June, simply because we recognize that system level resiliency is something that we need to spend more time focusing on. So um, I can tell you that, that PGM is continuing to work as a thought leader in the area, and I can tell you within the electricity industry, um, trying to find people, good cyber folks, to work in those companies is becoming of paramount importance to each of these companies. So study hard and make sure that you're dropping applications, for sure. So Jonathan, we're, uh, we're out of time, but I, I want to have one follow-up to that, which is, can you explain or, or I guess, provide a, an indication as to what the growth of your team has been and what you foresee that growth being in this particular domain of, of say, cyber physical system security? Sure. So I can tell you that uh, we definitely, we certainly have limitations on headcount. Uh, considering the breadth of work that we do, we only, we're a, a company of only about 700 employees. And what's interesting about it is we don't own the vast majority of the infrastructure that we do grid operations for. But within our company, we have a very disproportionate balance between uh, physical infrastructure folks and IT infrastructure folks, heavily weighted towards IT, simply because IT is the backbone of the vast majority of everything that we do, uh, whether it's market operations or grid operations. So that's an area of investment that we will continue to make, recognizing that whether it's IT and application development or cybersecurity specifically within those systems is only going to grow both in scope and scale for us as we continue to see the trend that we're seeing right now in terms of the dependence on IT systems. So it will continue to grow. So we're actually out of time, so uh, let's thank the speaker again. and.